Ladies and gentlemen, our program is about to begin. We would like to ask you to use this opportunity and ensure that all electronic devices have been turned to off or silent as a courtesy to those people seated around you and to our presenters on stage. Thank you for your cooperation. We'll be starting in just a moment. Microsoft Research is the world's strongest computing research organization. And computer science is the world's most important field in terms of changing our lives. Microsoft Research has some of the world's greatest researchers working on all types of problems from applied through uh, blue sky problems. If you look at the history of corporations, there's always been, you know, maybe one company that would put money into basic research and computer science. And right now, that one company is Microsoft. Basic research is important, believe it or not, for the economy, for society, and for humanity. If you want to make big advances, you need to take big risks. And basic research is about risky research. It's about stepping out from the usual frame and trying to do something different. I think it's remarkable to think that Gates and Mirvold made this decision to create Microsoft Research in 1991 when Microsoft was a tiny company. It was amazingly farsighted. Microsoft uh, Research exemplifies how a leading edge, fast moving company can actually succeed in preserving a high quality basic research organization and use it effectively to deliver products. Open collaboration is very important for any large research organizations because the kinds of problems that we're trying to solve, they're not solvable by individuals or individual organizations. They're only solvable by virtual collaboratories that involve multiple partners. What's important to realize is that Microsoft, uh, while they provide financial support for the research, much more important is they provide partnership. In any research, partnership comes from familiarity from sharing directions, from consistency of interaction. And that's one thing that Microsoft Research has delivered. We look forward to the fruits of that over the next years. Our field moves so quickly that we cannot predict two or three years out where our technology will be. All I know is that it's going to be different from what it looks like today. I think that 20 years hence, Microsoft Research will be able to look back on what by then will be the longest continuous uninterrupted stretch of the greatest research lab in computing technology the world's ever seen. What I anticipate is that Microsoft Research is going to remain the greatest computing research organization in the world. And that's going to help the world move the field of computer science forward. It's really impossible to forecast what's going to happen, and that's the exciting part. Please welcome Christian Borgs. Okay. So, thanks for coming back, most of you. And <laughs> our next speaker is Adam Kalai, who is from our lab here. And he will talk about machine learning and crowdsourcing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a couple of projects. Uh, one of them is joint with Tuliu and Ohad Shamir from Microsoft, and the other is uh, and with Serge Balanji from UCSD and Omer Tammuz, and the other was George uh, Pierkos from Berkeley. And I also want to acknowledge uh, the thousands of people in the crowd on Mechanical Turk who helped uh, with this research uh, and their paid pennies um, for answering very simple, short questions. And actually, um, one of the problems I want to talk about today is the problem that computers think about things or look at things in a very different way than people do. And I noticed that when I was trying to create these slides and I wanted a graphic of a crowd and I was searching through the clip art for crowd and all I got were, you know, people dancing or people with flags or fireworks and then I searched for groups of people. I, couldn't, I just couldn't find, I couldn't communicate with the computer and say what I wanted in terms of a crowd. And I think that's something that machine learning and crowdsourcing can help solve. Uh, so I'll talk about that today, or help address a little bit. Um, so let me first just talk a little bit about machine learning. So what do you do in machine learning typically? You start with a set of data somehow, maybe a bunch of images. Or, and you have to choose a representation for that data. You have to choose features or attributes like the color, the size, the shape, or whatever. And then you label the data according to that uh, representation. And that used to be done by graduate students, and more and more that's being done by a crowd of people. 
I um, mean, there's all kinds of challenges. People may not be consistent. Uh, people may try to cheat you. And there's an active area of research on that. And I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, and also, the, another important step in machine learning, once you have the label data, is running algorithms. You run a clustering algorithm, a regression, a classifier. And there's been a ton of work on that. And we have excellent off-the-shelf software by now uh, for doing that. But really, the first step is, in many ways, the most important, choosing the right features for the data, choosing the right representation. And that's still kind of a black art. There's not a great theory for how to do that. And, and that's what we're going to hope to use the crowd for. So today I'm going to talk about using the crowd for trying to choose a representation for the data. And the idea is once you have that, you, have, uh, you can end-to-end -end automate the whole system. It's automatic, or as I like to say, it's crowd -omatic. You don't need a researcher anymore because you can just uh, throw everything to the crowd. Okay. Um, so let me just say a word about representation. So one way to represent data is to give features, numbers for each image or object. Another way is to represent things by similarity. And uh, increasingly in machine learning, that's very popular. So if you want to, say, uh, represent your data, you actually can embed it in space. And two things which are close are very similar, and things which are far apart are very different. And that's uh, not only popular in machine learning, but that's also very natural for people. So for the first project, we decided to do things based on similarity. OK, so we can take a set of images from anywhere, let's say a tie store even, as simple as that. And we take these images, and we go to Mechanical Turk, There's a, where people, there's a, thousands of people ready to work and uh, wanting to make money. We ask them very simple questions. We can pay half a cent, and they answer tons of these questions very quickly. And we ask them, you know, is this tie more like this tie or that one? And they answer these questions. And pretty quickly, our system figures out things like, you know, well, gee, this is a bow tie, and this is a necktie. So we don't need to ask if this bow tie is more like this bow tie or necktie. It asks adaptive questions. And so it saves money by asking better questions. And hopefully, by asking these questions to the crowd, we get an understanding of the data, or at least how the crowd views the data. Okay. Um, so how can you view the output of this system? Uh, well, uh, so the input, remember, is a set of images. We go to the people in Mechanical Turk, and we ask them these questions. And then we get an output. And you can view it as an embedding of things. I can only show you two dimensions. But in these two dimensions, you can see that you know, it got the gross features right. The bow ties are on one side, or, and the neckties are on another. I don't have a mouse here, um, but what I'm going to try to use is the Connect system. Let's see if this works. Connect. Let's see here. <laughs> so the nearest neighbors, <laughs> it works well. Um, the nearest neighbors of each object here are shown. So you have the object, and then you see from left to right the, the nearest object according to what the system thinks and so forth. And this works for ties. Um, but it can work for any data set. So let's try again. Connect. There we go. Floor tiles. Um, so for floor tiles, uh, also works. So these are a collection of floor tiles. And you see for the four, for example, the system thinks the five, seven, two, six are the most similar. And actually, the computers, we tried it with computers, and they didn't agree because the four and six have very different backgrounds. The computers have a very different understanding of what's similar with floor tiles, for example. Um, actually, the Connect system has improved a lot. I don't know if you know. You can even, you can even do it with very fine things like your tongue. So I'm going to show you. Ready? <laughs> connect. <laughs> connect. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> OK. Um, and sure enough, you get the plain floor tiles on one side and the ornate floor tiles on another side. Uh, I'll stop with that for now. So let's skip ahead. So we have uh, here we did it with the faces of researchers at Microsoft. And sure enough, when you ask people what's similar with faces, uh, you get uh, gender as the most important attribute. And uh, my manager, Jennifer Chase, is on the uh, left, the most feminine person in Microsoft <laughs> Research. <right? laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> um, OK. And, uh, but, but the nice thing is you can do this generically on any data set. We did it on uh, bumper stickers. And you get the potty jokes on one side and the dirty jokes. And you get the political jokes on another part. OK, so you can, uh, you can also use it to create what we call a similarity browser, which I'll demonstrate uh, at the reception. So if you want, you can, uh, you can go browse things by clicking on more similar things. It kind of zooms in. So if you're looking for uh, a, floor a certain type of floor tile or something appeals to you, you can click on it. It'll show you more and more similar ones and so forth. And this can be used, I'll skip ahead, uh, glasses, flags. Let's say you saw a flag of a country and you didn't know its name. How would you look it up? This kind of system can help you. Um, the first experiment we did, which was fun, was actually suggested by Sean Cockaday, um, was letters. And he said, why don't you do this with letters? I thought, that's crazy. 
is an E more like an S or a U? I mean, what do you think? <laughs> and you kind of get something here. You get the sharp letters on one side and the round ones in the other. But what, what I really like is that actually if you look at the data a little more carefully, not in the first two dimensions, but in later dimensions, you get separation between the vowels and consonants. You get separation between the tall letters and the short letters. You get uh, roughly an alphabetical ordering of things. So by asking these very simple questions, of, you know, is an E more like an S or a U or all of these triples, you can extract these uh, multiple different features because you have a diverse crowd answering these questions. Okay? Just to be clear, by the way, the, the system we're talking about does not use any computer vision. Uh, it does not look at the pixels of the images. And in this case, the pixels wouldn't help. A computer, by looking at the pixels inside an E, would not be able to tell whether it's a vowel or consonant. That's something that we're using our own world knowledge. Uh, people are using their own world knowledge to answer these kind of things. Okay. Um, then the next project we decided is something that uh, other people care about, which is kittens. And uh, so, how, you know, people love to click on pictures of cute kittens. So here uh, we have a website called Kitten War. It's not ours. Uh, and Polly, for example, has won 60% of her matches. She's very cute. Um, <laughs> but what makes Polly cute? We don't know. So we asked the crowd, and instead of asking for similarity in this case, we said, why not just name the features? You know what you know what you're using to base similarity or base cuteness on, so why not just name things? So we asked the crowd and we got them to give us a bunch of possible features that they might use in evaluating how cute a kitten is. And then we asked them to label all the kittens based on how cute they were, or not, not how cute they were, based on these different features or attributes. And then um, we built classifiers. So the classifier is how, how often will this kitten win? Well, basically, um, it depends on how much you're willing to pay. If you're willing to pay five people, you'll ask three of them how small it is and two of them how adorable it is. If you're willing to ask 20 people, you'll have something about smirking and young and so forth. So um, the good thing, the only thing I'll say about this, the good thing is we weren't just asking people how cute this kitten is. We ended up asking them all sorts of other things in order to get at how cute they were um, in order to do that. And um, I'll just wrap up here and th thank you very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. We have time for some questions, some proposals, what he should look at next. I always yeah, yeah. appear in some of these pictures where I have nothing to do. That's, that's our <laughs> Adam joking. But any questions? Yes, we have done that actually. So we've uh, we've already done. Pizza question. Oh, the question was, can we ask the crowd what project to do? Um, and the answer is yes. So we've already done that. So we've actually we um, the reason we did that was we wanted to run some kind of risque experiments, but we didn't feel comfortable doing them ourselves. So we asked the crowd to propose <laughs> experiments that we could run, and then we would run them. And so we have the entire system automated. So they proposed, um, can you tell the gender of somebody by their handwriting? which was not that exciting, but I mean, but multiple people proposed that same one, so we went with that, and we actually had the crowd then send us their handwriting. They took pictures with their phone and emailed it. To, so the entire system, from choosing the problem to labeling, the, to getting the data, to labeling the data, to, you know, from the end to end, so really you don't need a researcher now. You can just <laughs> write paper after. We still have to write the paper, I guess, but maybe someday that will be automated too. The answer That's is yes, question. you can tell the gender about 75% of the time. <laughs> yeah, another okay. question. So are there interesting ethical issues that arise in the use of Mechanical Turk? Yes. <laughs> are you willing to share? I'm not the best person to ask about that. I mean... Um, I think it may actually be have a pen. Well, I think Kate oh, yeah. may bring there sort of this question about the six um, challenges, provocation for big data. I think that may touch that a little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, you know, what... Crawford, Yes, one of our speakers later today, Kate Crawford, may, I think, touch on that. But we'll ask her to. But we made sure to pay well over minimum wage, even though we could have paid people well under minimum wage. Um, that's just one of the issues. I'm sure there's many more. <laughs> OK, I think okay. we should wrap up. Thank you. And um, I lost my. Do you have a program, Jennifer? OK, fine.